Hey, welcome, grab yourself a coffee. I apologise for that terrible stereotypical New York accent. This is Babs, one of the co-hosts of Over Underrated, and I am uh, making the fool of myself in front of you all because our latest episode, we are going back to New York. We've done New York art rock, but now we're doing New York indie with Vampire Weekend as overrated and Nation of Language as underrated. We're not by ourselves this time. We have my friend George Thurdy as a guest talking about the two bands and introducing us to Nation of Language. And we hope you enjoy this very much. Get out of there. Oh God, no. What's another? Hey, I'm walking here. There we go. Oh, hang on. Yeah, what are we calling this podcast? <laughs> Was it over underrated? Over underrated. Sous évalué. Urvachets. Welcome to another episode of Over Underrated with Fran and Babs. How are you doing today, Fran? Uh, I am doing fine. Obviously, I'm very excited about the Jubilee about to happen in the UK, aren't we all? Platy Jubes, I heard. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> I mean, we've got a four-day weekend, but there's no bunting in my streets or anywhere. That's a good thing. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think people care, but we've got four days off and it's raining, so full steam ahead. So is your you, is your road not doing a street party? Oh no, I mean okay. I never found anyone who does a street party apart from uh, the front page of the Sun seemed to find these people, but <laughs> no one else in the UK seems to be doing it. Oh no, like I I have uh, really? I, I have friends who uh, who are getting involved. Like I have friends who live like on like a close in London. Oh really? And they're all kind of coming together. Yeah, no, it's it definitely is a thing. I yeah, I will be in um you know royal full Belgium, but with mm-hmm. no. With no bank holidays, uh, I'm afraid. Oh. But thankfully, I have been uh, listening to some good music this week. So Ooh. I have been listening to the new Block Party album, which I'm really enjoying. And I've been listening to a lot of Kim Gordon, because I saw her finally on uh, on Sunday evening, two years after I was meant to, and it was amazing. I mean, she I, I thought she was in her 60s. She was... She's 69 years old. Gee. You would never guess it in a million years. She looked amazing. She rocked out, like, at the end, holding her guitar aloft. I, you know, her album was one that I listened through a couple of times, but hadn't really revisited since it came out. So, yeah, basically, very good experience. Would recommend going to see Kim Gordon live if she's coming your way. What have you been listening to, Fran? I listened to the new Harry Styles album. Because I do like his number one single. um, But... It's the only song I like on the album. Mm. I'm sad because that's a, a One Direction fan. I had high hopes for Harry and he hasn't delivered for me. <laughs> I haven't knowingly heard one of his new songs, but I know he's doing very well and breaking all sorts of streaming records. Well, do you like the song Take On Me by Heart? I do like the song Take On Me by Heart. Well, so does he. And <laughs> his new single is very much Take On Me by Heart. So I like it, although I'm very aware that it's a song I loved beforehand he just re- reworked it slightly okay. with kid carpet i think is that or kid harpoon even as his carpet co-writer harpoon. some sort of kid some sort of kid helps out <laughs> <laughs> but fran uh nice as it is to chat to you about what music you've we've been listening to we have a guest today that we are ignoring welcome george to the hello podcast. thanks for having me what have you been listening to george yeah i was just trying to think um my parents visited recently and I've slowly been inheriting their um, record collection. So some some random vinyl from the 80s, I think is what I've been listening to. Nice. Uh, bit of Blondie, I think some Depeche Mode. Um, but like all these things I didn't listen to as a kid because they were on vinyl and my parents didn't have a vinyl, uh, didn't have a record player anymore. So I'm discovering what my parents' music taste was before I was born, which is kind of interesting. Oh, that's but, uh, pretty cool. Yeah. So your parents had vinyl, then what, had kids and got rid of the record player? You were too expensive? Yeah, I, I only, <laughs> yeah probably. I only really remember listening to music on CD. I mean, I was born in, uh, I was born in 1993, so, you know, CDs starting to uh, dominate, I guess. Yeah. Or tapes, at least. But, yeah. And we still think it's the best, Fran. Yes, definitely. CDs. Okay. Though I, go, I go. do know because uh, George George is a friend of mine, and I know he has bought a record player recently. So, so yeah, yes, how's I that can going? Play all the records I'm inheriting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How are you finding it? Does it make you feel more superior, more reflective when you you know you take it out and you put it and you play it rather than just you know listening on Spotify? I mean, I do both still. Yeah. But... <laughs> okay. 
Very good. But yeah, I do, I do feel very superior as a general rule. Yeah. <laughs> I was in a coffee shop earlier and a, a guy was having a birthday party and he opened his present and guess what? It was a vinyl player. Oh. And I thought a coffee shop and vinyl just makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. I actually got my first, my second CD of the year from Arcade Fire and had uh, an inlay and everything. So unlike Spectre, who just gave me a plastic wallet, Arcade Fire still delivered and even had a postcard inside it. So thank you, Arcade Fire, for not giving up on CDs. <laughs> mm. I bought um, the last CD I bought was Telepath because mm. it's one of those uh, I can't even remember if I've talked about them on the podcast before but it's one of those bands where their main album is not on Spotify or anything else mm. or, or even on YouTube and yeah again it's come in the kind of slender not plastic but the slender CD and I mean okay it's from 2008 or whatever but it's just like come on guys you know your case is what you want yeah exactly oh, wow. and this chat is getting very nerdy Sorry. very quickly <laughs> But I mean, George, you were talking about, um, you know, listening to your parents' music taste from back in the day. And I would say both bands that we're listening to today, that we're going to discuss today, definitely have retro vibes to them. So who have you brought? I actually, well, firstly, what is the topic from today? I We need to agree on this because I guess it's what, New York synth pop, synth rock? What do you guys think? Uh, well, Vampire Weekend, Babble with the synths. Yeah. Like, I guess New York indie, I guess they both kind of work in that sort of area okay well yeah, yeah so new york indie and uh yeah who who are we chatting as overrated and underrated today george overrated we're talking about uh vampire weekend is uh is overrated and nation of language is underrated very excited to get into it uh so let's do it Vampire Weekend. Now, basically, guys, this is a peek behind the curtain. The way we often do this podcast is we we think of what's an underrated band that we want to talk about and who could we match <laughs> with them. So Fran and I are keen to get into Nation of Language because neither of us had heard of them before and it definitely sounded right up our street. And when we were discussing the kind of band that could pair with them, we came up with, with Vampire Weekend with George. So George, I know a little bit of what you think about Vampire Weekend, but not quite how much you think they're they're overrated so yeah what's what's your relationship with the band have you seen them live etc yeah so um yeah the, the first album came out in 2008 i think when i was uh 15 so kind of coming to the end of secondary school and kind of starting to form my own music taste and you know hearing about bands from other other yeah people at school and so the first album i remember really well and i remember really vividly is uh yeah coming in a kind of summer period and being played all the time and having a very kind of summery energy and then um i kind of followed them for the next two albums and then lost track of them when they had a, a bigger gap i think so i i don't personally have anything against them i quite enjoy them i did actually see them live i think after their second album uh yes. in brighton but i i only remember this when we started uh when we talked about doing this for the podcast so <laughs> um so they were fine <laughs> yeah I, I don't think they were bad at all i just i i have no really yeah really firm memories of it um but it was at the brighton center i'm pretty sure can't remember if i went with my brother or not but anyway um yeah i i, I can't say very much about what they were like live but um I have seen them live. <laughs> I've seen them live. Okay, so not necessarily bad, but not necessarily unforgettable either. No, yeah, I think that's fair. I think my my kind of reaction when you suggested it was, uh, they might well be overrated, but I still like them. I think is basically my my reaction. Okay. And I made a playlist of songs that I like, that I thought were vaguely kind of uh, eclectic, different, but um, uh, yeah. Mm. Okay. Fran, what's your opinion on a VW? So I was working in the Zavi in 2008 and the albums came through and it has a very striking album cover and none of us have ever heard of Vampire Weekend. So we popped it on in the stockroom before its release and I instantly liked A-Punk and thought, oh, this sounds pretty decent. So then on Monday, we popped it into the uh, CD player at work and then we all decided that they had two good songs and dismissed them, and then they became massive. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Fair enough. Fran's A and R, you know, <laughs> senses yeah, not working again. Terrible. Uh, uh, and then, um, yeah, then you know, every album I would hear the s- songs. I saw my Isle of Wight 2010, and I liked maybe five songs, but I then found when they weren't playing the singles, it was very much the same throughout. Um, but I do think that they are bands who get more interesting as they go along. And they have like kind of shed the, the, the Paul Simon vibes from the first two albums. And it, with the latest album, you know, they always seem to be doing new things. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan, but I'm not, I don't hate them yet. Um, I will tell you more as the podcast goes along. But work in progress so far. And perhaps yourself. So in 2008, it was my last year at, u- at university. And um, I think at uni is where I really got into kind of the indie that was coming out of the UK and, and the US, obviously. So I think by the time that Vampire Weekend came along, maybe because, you know, they're so obviously a university band on their first album. I mean, really, one of the songs that you've put on the playlist, George, literally references that. I took against them a little bit because I, I don't know. I, 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 again, I'm less of a snob now, but their whole look is very preppy uh they felt like the kind of people i wouldn't get on with at university and while you know i remember on the alt j episode i talked about how i liked how they used references that you know you don't always get alt j have i think a bit more of a sense of humor than than uh vampire weekend so i thought so it just felt a bit inaccessible a bit pretentious that that was how i felt and a punk was everywhere and it really (laughs) annoyed me um and I checked to see if I had any Vampire Weekend songs saved. Cape Cod Quasa Quasa is my my favourite, I think, because of, you know, this feels so unnatural, Peter Gabriel too. But I think A Punk was a bit overplayed. Oxford comma, again, just I like grammar in English, but I was just like, oh, just feel so put on. Um but you know, reading about them for for this podcast, you know, they obviously took against that and point out that you know one of them is of iranian origin and gay another one went was there on a scholarship etc etc so even though that's the image they were cultivating um that's not really how they were and yeah i was really surprised at how i i only associated vampire weekend with yeah the paul simon first album vibes and it seems they have changed a lot Mm. uh since then so yeah thanks george for putting together kind of a fairly eclectic playlist and for not putting a punk oxford comma on it (laughs) i didn't think that would be necessary somehow but yeah (laughs) i think they were described once as the whitest band in the world and they really did not like that at all (laughs) yeah again especially that one of them is iranian and like yeah one is jewish one is of italian origin you know as they said none of us is a wasp you know the Mm. Uh, you know, they're, they're not, you know, the, the, the elite America, even though they studied, I think, at Columbia and did, and did cultivate that vibe. But again, yeah, that sh- shouldn't be a reason for for kind of disliking someone, right? Um, I, mean, I mean, they say they're, they're the outsiders all their life. So mm-hmm. the fact that you, the fact, well, the fact that they look like they're preppy boys is, is completely opposite, really. But yeah, I I will say, so in, in doing the research, I'd kind of forgotten that the lead singer, Edgar Koenig, was one of the co-writers on Hold Up by Beyonce. And I saw this short video about how he worked with Diplo on it. And it, it was super interesting because he's like, yeah, me and Wes, we don't get in the studio very often. Uh, but we, we got together four times and he told the story of how it's like an Andy Williams sample. And then mm. it, it, it's all it's based on the maps by A.A.S. Yeah, yeah, a tweet, no, a set of two tweets that he did. And he just kind of put the two together with Diplo, forgot about it. And then they were like, oh, yeah, Beyonce might use this. And he was like, ha, ha, ha. And then she did. And he was like, wow, it really surprised me. So kudos for that. And I will have to shout out the fact that uh, him and Rostam are in the Charlie XCX video, Boys, which is unequivocally the best music video of all time <laughs> and what i've just realized on re-watching it today is that ezra koenig is in a section with mark ronson who used to date rashida jones who uh now ezra that, has a kid that with. new york scene isn't it new york scene babies uh so so there we go that's my little geeky geeky facts has anyone heard his rap music before vampire weekend no i did I not know about any. it i can't find anything <laughs> Because it does not appear like that, that would be his uh, pre vampire Weekend music. No, not at all. But, uh... And wasn't he also an English lecturer? A what? He, he, he like an English teacher. Yeah, English teacher. Yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, he, he looks 20 years old in the first album. How old yeah. is he? Wow. Okay, I think he, he's, pro- he's clearly a man of many talents. And I'm definitely, you know, I'm definitely not opposed to people mixing in different types of genres. Like, I... I I mean, I'm not a huge Paul Simon fan. Um... I have to say, I would guess both of you are more probably George. I would imagine you're a bit of a Paul Simon yeah. fan, right? Um, I but yeah, I guess 
I, I wasn't such so on board of this particular blending again, probably because it's just a bit too poppy for me. But uh, yeah. but yeah. So yeah, let's I mean, go to you, it. You, you both mentioned Paul Simon, and uh, <laughs> yeah, like that that was some of the music, my parents' music that did survive to CD. So um, Graceland, but also Rhythm of the Saints. And uh, when I was researching for this, I saw yeah the first album being described as Afro pop inspired, and I was like, yeah, it makes sense that I like it then, doesn't it? But, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I found out that Kwasa Kwasa from Cape Cod Kwasa Kwasa is a uh, rhythm from DRC. So uh, okay, but like right, let's let's get into it, George. Let's. Carry on the university chat uh, and tell us what your first song is. <laughs> yeah, so the first song is uh, Campus. It's Babs, uh, Babs reference from the first album, Vampire Weekend. And as I already kind of said, yeah, um, this album is the one I remember the best and, and kind of most fondly. Um, and yeah, really associated with summer with me, for me, with the, the, yeah, the energetic and kind of bright uh I mean, all the songs in that album, I feel like, go about a thousand miles an hour at one point. Um, yeah, and on this, I enjoy the, the fairly sol- solid drums and the kind of syncopated guitar and keyboards. Um, and the, the lyrics are very evocative to me. I mean, you know, I don't, couldn't really tell you exactly what he's saying, but it's it seems very clear. And um, yeah, I also really enjoy the the kind of slightly chaotic drum feels sometimes that feel like they kind of, tripping over themselves in in how fast they're trying to go so i mean yeah if you don't like that kind of 100 mile an hour pace uh of the first album then i guess you're probably not going to like this very much either but um yeah i enjoy this song i I can't i couldn't tell you particularly why i chose this one but um it came to mind fairly quickly so yeah fran uh yeah so this kind of feels like most of the debut album um apart from the big singles a lot of songs that sound like this and it's kind of like lo-fi, but of a hi-fi budget, if that makes sense. So it feels like four, four teenagers in a bedroom, but it sounds like a, a pop band. Um, so for me, it, it doesn't really work for me. Um, but the YouTube comments are quite nice, because everyone describes what it sounds like. And it sounds like an American anime film, uh, a college fantasy from 2012, uh, the end credits of a movie, but hasn't finished yet, and a confident girl who has two parents and has two guys fighting over her. There we wow. go. Campus described by YouTubers. <laughs> really into it. Choose yours. It's like an adventure game. Uh, so, so perhaps, how would you describe Campus? <laughs> well, so it's interesting. I think your lo-fi, hi-fi comments have helped contextualize it in my brain because I like what I wrote was that I like the initial minimalism, but I don't really like the organs or like the more bombastic chorus. Mm. I prefer the bridge when it's just guitar, voice, drums, uh, and the ending as well. So, yeah you know it it took a couple of listens to i knew i, I knew i wasn't a huge fan but I, I it took me a while to pinpoint why so, and and i think i i kind of agree with you fran on that and yeah on the lyrics i mean um my personal pretentious favorite is uh walk to class in front of you spilled kefir on your kefir which is if you don't know the scarf that palestinian people wear so I was just like, wow, <laughs> like that is, you know. That, I always assumed he was saying caviar in that. No, event. I I found out but, today, uh, kefir on your kefir, if that's how you pronounce it. So yeah. I was I was like, that is absolutely, like, this unfortunately takes all the stereotypes of like. All the preppy stereotypes. The, the, preppy, yeah. the preppy people. Um, we can also empathize with that, can't we, guys? I mean, yes, of course. Of course. But I think, <laughs> We've but, all been there. <laughs> also, I think because, like I said, I, I think I was just finishing uni, so I was kind of like trying to move on from that. And so this yeah. this wasn't my vibe any anymore. I think as a teenager, George, I probably would have been way more into it. Cause I'd be yeah, like, probably that's what it is. They're, yeah. they're, 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 they are worldly. Like, they're obviously so worldly. Looking at yeah. lyrics on other... There's plenty of stuff that I, I don't know and, and I learn. Um, but yeah, Rolling Stone said this was... They ranked it 24 on the list of 100 greatest debut albums of all time. Pretty high. And Paul Simon likes the album. Uh, so yeah, he responded when when people kind of kept unfavorably comparing it to Grace Hunt. So that's that's nice. Uh-huh. <laughs> George, what's your second track? Well, the next one I've got written down, I can't remember what the, the order I put them on in, um, is Ya Ya Hey, mm-hmm. or, um, which is from the third album, actually, I think. Um, Modern Vampires of the City. And yeah, um, I, yeah, I, I just got really into this song at some point, I think quite a while after the album came out. Um, I think maybe I saw the music video, which is quite odd. I don't know if any of you have seen, either of you have seen it, but, um, and it kind of, uh, kind of captivated me in some way. 
Yeah, I think it's it's quite epic in a way. You know, obviously the subject matter, it's, you know, kind of about or a dialogue with God and all these kind of biblical references and um and that kind of thing. And yeah, I find this I find the the um the chorus kind of yeah, quite quite powerful in some way. I mean, obviously it's just quoting what, what God says in the Bible, right? Or in the in the Torah, I forget. Yeah, I am that I am. But I think the, the song builds it up very nicely and uh yeah, I enjoy the kind of gospel and choir like elements and the the more harpsichordy piano. Um but I, I know and I can imagine that quite a lot of people might find the really kind of nasal high uh yahes quite quite irritating. But uh yeah, I don't mind it personally. Just think as a song uh that I think's yeah, quite interesting lyrically, I know. I think all three of us aren't really lyric listeners, but um, yeah, I, I just think it's quite a nicely, I mean, the, the words themselves are just, you know, it's like it's, uh, you only say I am that I am, but who could ever live that way? Yeah, I just find it quite an interesting idea. Like, you know, is God like lonely? Like, <laughs> what, what is it like to be that kind of all, all powerful being or force or whatever? And are we assigning kind of human characteristics to an omnipotent uh, yeah, being? Yeah, certainly, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And then in the in the lyric video and the music video, like it seems to have nothing to do with the content. It's you know they're all kind of standing on a skyscraper in New York, uh, like fizzing up champagne bottles, um, in slow motion, um, which is quite weird <laughs> to watch. But uh, they have the lyrics over it, and um, after the the question is asked, uh, who could ever live that way? He does that kind of nonsense singing, that kind of gobbledygook, and on the lyrics it just puts a question mark. Okay. So it's, it's really like there's there's no answer to this, okay. but um, <laughs> wow, we're getting yeah. deep early on in uh, in this podcast. So- yeah, I mean, apologies. <laughs> no, 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 good. It's good. If, if you do read the YouTube chat, um, comments underneath that people can't decide if this is you know anti god or, or pro god. Yeah, this is maybe what he wants. Maybe wants people to have a, a chat about the lyrics. You know, what, what does he mean? Yeah, like, this has moved away from the Paul Simon Graceland's uh, pop from the debut album. Uh, I, I also like the harp score section. Uh, I like the uh, Food of Fire, Food of Flame section and the choir. Not a big fan of the mice singing. Um, yeah. <laughs> but he did that with um, Diane Young, didn't he? He had that like sort of like uh, vocal change. Yeah. So I think that yeah. is like his gadget for the album. Um, some people rate this as their best of a song. I yeah. think the, the hardcore fans do adore this. Um, I think it's a grower. I think I need to give it a few more listens, but I do enjoy how they've moved on from the first round sort of by this point. Uh, so I was firstly disappointed that this wasn't a clever outcast cover. It's called <laughs> Yahe. Uh, and I was interested to see that Rich Costi was involved in the mixing. Obviously, he's produced Muse and a bunch of other people. So when it started, I thought I would hate it, but actually, I really liked this song. And I liked yeah. the, what did you call it, fan? Mice singing? Um, mice. And I, it was one of those where I'm like, why? Why do I like this? This is so strange. But I guess it is, yeah, it, it is a weird song. And they're throwing a lot of different stuff at it that has like this very lush piano and all these nice harmonies. It took me many, li- I think it, it took me three lessons to kind of confirm that I did in fact like it. Um, but I did. I like the speak singing. Yeah. Uh, really unexpected from, from the Vampire Weekend that I knew. Especially odd for a single as well. It's mm. really nice. Yeah, it was it's a single, friendly, yeah. is it? Well, that's a win already. I wasn't really expecting Babs to like, like any of these. So. <laughs> I think that's how Fran often feels when he makes podcasts. <laughs> so better play this for me as well. But Because uh... yeah. when Diane Young came out, I was like, oh, wow, that's re- that's a really good song. <laughs> so, mm. um, I don't know that one. Is it similar say, but, to this? Or... Uh, not at all. Uh, <laughs> no, not really. No. But... Um, but one song by Vampire Weekend I do adore is on the Twilight soundtrack called Jonathan Lowe. And no one seems to know it, but do hunt it out, guys. No. It's, it's, okay. it's brilliant and has like some beautiful like violins on it. Check it out. But um, what's your next pick, George? My next pick is uh, going backwards an album to uh, Contra, Giving Up the Gun. Again, kind of like with Campus, I can't really tell you why I chose this one. Uh, it's the song that I remember best from this album. Uh, and it's yeah, kind of most evocative for me, I guess. Yeah, I enjoy particularly the the kind of uh, the breakdown, kind of halfway through the song, and then the, the middle eight, and then they go into the kind of dabbling in with the synths, as you said, Fran, and then uh, kind of bursting back in. I think um, the first couple of albums maybe they had a bit of a tendency to use fairly similar kind of uh, drum patterns, and this is maybe a little bit similar to the first album in that way. But I still enjoy it. And um, 
yeah, the music video is, is some kind of weird uh, tennis match, which in, involves cameos from Joe Jonas, Jake Gyllenhaal, and uh, one of the members of Wu-Tang Clan. So, like, they had some... Uh, wow. They had some cultural reach. So, uh, yeah, it just, uh, yeah, a song I enjoy. Yeah, you know you, you're, you're doing well when you have a, a Jonas brother in the video. <laughs> you know, <laughs> careers on a high... <laughs> Um, I really like the song, but what I found interesting, um, I don't know if Babs found the same research, is that the sampling let down by Radiohead on this album. No, song. wow, I really didn't know that. So th- those weird electronic sounds, that is the start of let down. Oh, wow. This is a bizarre thing to sample. I need it to to cost, that again. It must I have just... cost them a fortune, surely, to sample Radiohead. So I don't know why I've changed that. But um, I did GCC Music and... Uh, in the 90s, we were too poor to keep, have keyboards, so therefore we had to use xylophone. So it's nice to hear xylophone in the chorus, so hats off to uh, Vampire Weekend. Um, I do enjoy like, the electronic uh, beeps I mentioned and the throbbing bass. Um, yeah, what is interesting about Vampire Weekend is, does Ezra really ever test out his voice? He always seems to have the same sort of range per song. I've never heard him sort of go really high or really low. I guess with Diane Young, he's using you know electronics to change his voice around, but he pretty much sings the same in every single song, including this one. Maybe that's good or bad, up to you. But yeah, and, and I, th- I believe that this was first recorded in his rap uh, duo, La Homer Run, is that what they're called? I think, yeah. So, yeah, so back in 2000, 2004, then, then we released it. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of this. Babs? So I thought this sounded quite Jack Antonoff Ian. Uh, so I, I'm not surprised that you like it, Fran. I, Congratulations, I... you got engaged today, I believe. <laughs> yes, I did. I saw it to Margaret Qualley. <laughs> there we go. Um, yeah, this was so much poppier. Um, and you were talking about the xylophone, Fran. I wrote, mm-hmm. I take such exception to the xylophone. How could you? <laughs> I really do. Yeah, I thought I thought the sing- the chorus was really white. So yeah, my singing, fine. Here, I thought the chorus was very whiny. Um, I, I much prefer the bridges and the instrumental breakdown, as mentioned. The the female vocalist as well. Do you know, Do we know who that is? The, the other vocalist mm, mystery um but she's quite low in the mix as well so it's like i would have i would have liked her to come out a bit more and there's this kind of urgent disjointed bass which is normally my bag mm. but um unfortunately for me this this didn't quite save it sorry george <laughs> but check out the video perhaps. uh but the, the lyrics are really nice because it, it seems to be um yeah i, I think it's it's quite metaphorical. So it, I think it's about kind of getting older and, uh, you know, your body becoming a bit a bit like a cage, I, I suppose. But it, it, as in, it could literally be about a soldier because it's talking about your swords grown old and rusty, blah de da um, But it says, you know, when I was 17, I had wrists like steel and I felt complete. And now my body fades behind a brass charade and I'm obsolete. That's, that's, that's a nice pairing of, uh, of words. Although I had to look up what the tuk- Tukugawa smile was and it seems to be something related to um the japanese empire the japanese edo period which lasted from 1603 to 1867 so there we go <laughs> we've all we've all learned so you know i didn't quite enjoy the song but i i learned something which is nice yeah i wonder whether we need to talk about lyrics in, in general because i feel like i feel like they have nice he has a nice rhythm to the the lyrics often and, and and kind of clever rhymes even if i'm not entirely sure what he's saying a lot of the time mm-hmm. like you know, like I don't give a fuck about an Oxford com- comma. Just has a a really nice rhythm, like as even as a sentence, even if you're not as an it, opener so. as well. You know. Yeah. 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 I I I agree. The 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 words that he uses are are nice. And I mean, like I said, the Cape Cod Quasa Quasa being it feels so unnatural. Peter Gabriel. Too, yeah. I th- I think yeah. I I I would give him credit for that. The backing vocals is by Livy Gary and Anne. Donden. Thank you, Fran, for totally There's no link on Wikipedia, so I have no idea where they're from. <laughs> <laughs> There's also a double bass player as well. I mean, that's where that bubble comes from. Okay, but facts for you guys. So, yeah, so yeah, <laughs> but mixed reviews, but facts all around for this. So, what's your next one, George? And then, yeah, and then, uh, I picked Harmony Hall from the latest album from Father of the Brides. Um, in the interest of uh, spreading across the albums a bit, I really, uh, like I said at the beginning, I, I I think I bought the first three albums and then there was quite a big gap between uh, the third and the fourth. So I really didn't know this was coming out. And I only heard this as one of the first singles, I think, on the on the radio. Uh, and I only listened to the full album uh, for the first time when I was preparing for this, um, kind of in the background at work. So nothing really leapt out at me yet. I think I'll need to, to listen again. 
but yeah, I, I described the first album as very summary, at least uh, in my feeling. And I saw that uh, Koning described this one as a, a more springtime feel. So maybe they're working their way through through the seasons. Um, but yeah, I, I really enjoyed the song, kind of kind of the jaunty guitars and the the plonky uplifting piano, uh, which I'm very sure Babs doesn't like at all. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I, and the piano solo and uh, kind of uplifting chorus, I think it's just uh, quite nice to put together. I think I need to check out this album a bit more. Um, I think they went a bit more uh, collaborative and worked with different people. And uh, one of the main, I've forgotten what his name is, but one of the main guys left. Uh, so maybe that changed the sound a little bit. But uh, it feels it feels on a line and a continuum with the rest to me. But uh, yeah. Had you heard this album from? Yeah, I think the problem is that there's 18 songs so it's hard to get in but if you sort of like push away the filler there's maybe about seven decent songs in it um this is this is probably this and um the song this live are probably the standouts this has uh daniel um haim on vocals as well in fact there's troll people credited to this this, to to (laughs) some it does happen sometimes when a band member leaves it it, it allows them to you know collaborate a lot more so yeah he's he's definitely uh, calling his his mates uh to help out but um yeah i i think yeah this is one of the of the of their best singles um i i also didn't know that the band had um, lost members i mean that's six year break um it's got like 90s dance vibes it's got like a, a 90s baggy beat to it and some 90s house piano as well and like sort of like acoustic guitar lines sounds a bit of fleet and mac um but people I, i'm not a fan of the grateful dead i don't know if you guys are but apparently people say that it's stolen from a, a grateful dead song grateful <laughs> dead Dance. one of those bands yeah. that i do not know what they sound like at all i only yeah, yeah. Uh, Evan America's Pant is a deadhead, but I've never heard of him. But I think I believe this this is actually the highest uh, rating single in America. So this was a big hit for things like A Punk and Octocomma, and mm. it was Grammy nominated. But um, Babs, are you a fan of it? So I quite like the acoustic guitars at the beginning, mm. um, which yeah, I I, I I I it felt very I don't know it felt very almost yeah romantic like Spanish guitar. I appreciated it, but the moment he started singing, I was like. Mm, this is and i think also it is it's a little bit saccharine for me and i you know in in other parts i've enjoyed kind of a string here and there but i really didn't like the the chamber music section with the with the strings and the piano it did, <laughs> it did like i felt that again they they tr- they're trying a lot of different things here which i can appreciate and i can definitely appreciate the evolution and them, uh, you know, going beyond their initial roots, but it's not so much for me, I'm afraid. Um, they do enjoy doing like a, a harpsichord section or like a like a random like uh, cello break. They do like to kind of uh, up their game in that way. But I guess if you're not a fan of the harpsichord, then you're not I mean, listen, be a fan. Golden Brown by Stranglers well, is a great well. tune, but uh, but I I prefer them. <laughs> Although I think I'd get on better with Vampire Weekend than I would with The Stranglers. So, <laughs> so your final track, George? Uh, for the final track, going back to the first album, progressing back to uh, to the the lo-fi hi-fi. So it's I stand corrected. Yeah, I I I think this is an album that I would generally say I enjoy all of the songs. You know, I just uh, listen to it so often that I know them all so well. Uh, I chose this one. Um, as a bit of a bit of a calmer, kind of slower song compared to the the more more energetic ones on the rest of the album, but then you know it it can't they can't help themselves on this album. They still end up um, accelerating quite fast towards the end. Yeah, and I I enjoy the the kind of uh, melody of the of the lyrics of the uh, I stand I oh I stand corrected um, that kind of rhythm and melody I, I enjoy and and the drums again, um, which although they're fairly uh, fairly consistent throughout the first album I, I yeah i think they're quite effective what did you guys think so when when it started and it sounded slow i was worried uh but here the strings work for me so i i really liked the cello kind of you know as as it comes in and i really liked the pacing of the song um it, again a bit like uh with campus it, I, I needed more listens than i would have thought to have an a uh, have an opinion on it um I, I didn't save it to my library, but by by the third listen, I was like, no, this this is decent uh, actually, and and yeah, I'm I'm surprised as you are, George, that I liked the slowest song more mm-hmm. than some of the others. Mm-hmm. Fran, 
Yeah, I have no recollection of this song until I listen to it. Um, it's got the same bass line as Campus, the do 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 and it's got more keyboards. I think the in the chorus, the drum pattern changes from like that beat to like a more like simple like rock drum, and I think that helps the chorus push. Um, I love the string flashes, and I listen to how it's written. I can imagine that if they replace the keyboards with guitars, this could be the Strokes. I can imagine Julian oh, Casablanca yeah. singing this. It's got that sort of like mm-hmm. urgent sort of like feel to it. So I can imagine like a, you know, a Nick's guitar on top of it. My thoughts, I could be talking outfit nonsense. New York collab uh, asking well, for it, you know. Yeah. Uh, but yeah I, yeah, I enjoyed it. And I don't know why I had not heard the song before. I apologise, Vampire Weekend. <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you for, for yeah, a broad and unexpected Vampire Weekend playlist, I would say. Like, like I, I thought it was going to be 5A punks and I was going to dislike it, and it, it definitely wasn't. Um, but Fran, what how, what's your opinion then as we've progressed through this? Are Vampire Weekend overrated? I think I just miss them a lot when they first came out, just because, you know, it's one of those bands who seem to be massive but only had two strong songs. So I think when the second album came out, I was like, eh, who cares anymore? Um, but yeah, I over time I have they've grown on me and uh, like they are like massive in America. Like their n- number one albums for an indie band is quite rare. So maybe slightly overrated. I don't think they are the, the number one indie band in the world. To be fair, I think they're a decent uh, band who have some decent ideas and. It's nice that they're trying to go their own way rather than stealing, well, not stealing, or, you know, rather than showing their influences on their sleeve too much. Have it yourself. Yeah, I I think what I hadn't realised until I was looking at the playlist is how I so obviously know what the first two album covers are like because they're so original, especially Contra with the, you know, the, the woman in the polo shirt. On, who sued? On the front. Who, I, I, I saw, yeah. even though <laughs> she sued the photographer as well. So I guess, yeah, the photographer mm. gave permission, but... She is the model in which, yeah, fair, fair enough. Um, so, yeah, I, de- I definitely... Okay, apart from A-Punk, I don't feel like they've permeated too much since then, right? So, you know, it's it's not like one of those ones where every time they release an album, I'm like, oh, here we go now, this, this is all we're, we're going to listen to. And I think George's playlist definitely made me realise that, yeah, that there's more to them than than their initial album, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. And, I, yeah, I will definitely be listening to Yahe again. But guys, they have 5.3 million <laughs> monthly listeners on I on Spotify, say, well, <laughs> and that just yeah, that really surprises me. And I I can admire them for being creative, for for thinking out of the box, and for trying to put things together. But I'm afraid that for me, it's just it's just not my my personal taste. So I I would say that they're still overrated. Although I like them definitely a bit more than before. So thank you, George. <laughs> And do you know what kind of uh, Vampire Weekend songs you would be interested to listen to, Babs? Or is it kind of on a song by song basis? I think it is a song by song basis because, to be honest, like, yeah, with Cape Cod Quasa Quasa, I hadn't hadn't listened to it in ages. And I was like, oh, yeah, this is this is fine. Um, I I think, yeah, more Yahays and and yeah, the, the broad range of songs where they use strings, because I think when it works, it's really good. But when it doesn't, it's not good. Well, in that case, listen to Jonathan Lowe, please. OK, there we it's, go. It doesn't sound like any other Vampire Weekend song. That has and a the song that you kept mentioning, is it Dying Young, Fran? What's what's yeah, that like? That's a, Dying Young, yeah. You might. I, it was quite heavily played in the UK. So, I, was, so yeah. I, I think you may I, you may have heard it. I missed um, it clearly. Give it a, give it a try. It's quite hooky. Okay. It's got it's got him singing the same line, but then he changes the uh, the moderator, so it changes pitch each time he t- says it. This could be annoying. Mm. It's, you know, it's... Mm. it's also quite a short song, so if you do find it annoying, then it's a little quickly. But... Oh, there we go. <laughs> I'd say maybe try the third album. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like, if you don't want more a punks, then yeah, don't listen to the first album. Yeah. The second one, I, I, it was okay, but I wasn't so into it. And then the third one, third one, I think is pretty strong. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, having, I think Fran and I probably, well, Fran, do, did you think they're overrated? Yes, you, you said they're overrated. So, yeah, I, yeah. I think I enjoy them, but they don't deserve to be the number one band in America and you know, selling out everywhere yet. No, they're not good. But I think you'd probably agree that they probably deserve more of a chance, even if you do think they're overrated, like like we are clearly. I think that's, that's it's obvious that there's more to them than the the more, the more mainstream songs. Yeah, they, 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 and they can definitely fill a twenty-track playlist. So, Which is know. yeah, the the ideal <laughs> number for a playlist, right? 
<laughs> of course, of course. Hey, podcast lovers. Now available, a new podcast experience featuring exclusive miniseries like Food Babes and all new series that takes a fun look at everyone's real first true love, food. Milky Way Marvels, a lighthearted astronomy series where we explore the fascinating wonders of our galaxy. Pop culture icons, an entertaining, nostalgic look back at various nouns in popular culture, plus more. Relax, enjoy, listen, laugh, and maybe even learn. Podcast, presented by Sonic Embassy. Now streaming everywhere you listen. Access quick links to your favorite places to listen now at solo.to slash Sonic Embassy. Underrated. George, what is the underrated act we're talking about today and why have you picked them? So the, the underrated act is a band called Nation of Language. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess kind of three piece. Why are we talking about them? Yeah, I... Um, a lot of a lot of the way I, I kind of find new music and consume new music is I listen to the live stream of, of KXP, which are a, a radio station in Seattle, independently owned and and all that kind of thing. Yeah, when I started working, I just listened to a very long YouTube playlist of like adding music to it until that playlist got too long, uh, so that YouTube wouldn't load it anymore. <laughs> Impressive. And then uh, <laughs> and then I uh, I realized I was adding a lot of KXP videos and that they just had a live stream. So basically, since since I don't know, 20, since 2017, 2018, uh, I just when I've been working, I've just had KXP on in the background. Uh, the Morning DJ was a very big fan of of Nation of Language from from early on, and um, so he played them quite a lot and was very enthusiastic. And so I was kind of exposed to them over a long period of time, and and I also really enjoyed them. I think I probably heard uh, Russian Fever and Wall and I first on the radio, and uh, yeah, so I've. Uh, kind of sort them out after that and, and listen to them on, on YouTube and on Spotify. And they came to, to Nijmegen, the city where I live, in last month, I think, in April. Uh, so a really very small um, concert venue. And they were in this small room at this small regional uh, venue. And they still weren't sold out. Um, I mean, I don't think they're very well known in, in Europe in general. But um, yeah, I, I do generally think they're a good band and uh, that more people should know them yeah i guess you know kind of commonalities with uh with vampire weekend you know new york maybe a bit kind of arty pretentious preppy potentially um one article i found one interview i found was how craft work and werner holzog uh, inspired their albums and i was like okay that kind of uh <laughs> that covers uh, a very specific group of people but uh so uh and apparently yeah they um they, they asked their guests to fund their first album as a wedding present because they, they couldn't fund it any other way and then released their first album in May 2020. So it was kind of pretty pretty terrible timing, which is uh, at least to go on tour, which is probably why they have a second album out so soon, soon afterwards because they were just stuck in their tiny New York apartment um, writing songs. So, yeah. So, yeah, I think when George and I were discussing what bands to talk about, I'd never heard of this band, and Fran, I don't think you'd heard of this band no. before either, which is very surprising because they are pure synth pop. Um, I thought that their name sounds like a Benetton advert brought to life. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm not sure about the not, name. I'm not sure about the name. Right. Also, could be a bit fascist. I don't know. I don't know. It's 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 a strange one. It doesn't it doesn't sync with what their what their music is like, and um, yeah, I I think. Yeah, they, they, so they really, they're not very well known. They have 203,000-ish monthly listeners um, and their Spotify bio is Love Angel Music Baby, which really made me laugh because that was the Gwen Stefani <laughs> album. Um, and I wondered, is it because I guess synth pop isn't really, you know, a genre du jour at the moment? Like if, if, if what when I think of what are the most popular genres, it is hip hop generally rap it is pop mostly k-pop uh and if any rock genre is more popular i guess it's more pop punk that's coming back at the moment especially with like machine gun kelly and and widow smith or, or, or all of that so yeah when when i started listening i was like this is up mine and friend streets i would say generally so how how have we never heard about them but then yeah when i when i saw that their their in it, the album was meant to be released april 3rd 2020 i thought ah, okay maybe maybe that's part of it and um 
yeah just maybe the fact that you know we aren't in such an indie kind of landscape time we've just talked about vampire weekend they came out you know as as indie was very popular so yeah very excited to get get into this because i think there's there's a lot going on and you know fran you were mentioning about vampire weekend not wearing their influences on the sleeve i think this band very much wears their influences on their sleeves but i generally don't mind it how about you i think in america synth wave is quite popular Synth uh, Rave, did you say? Synth Wave. Oh, Synth Wave. Okay, I was like, oh, what's Synth a, Rave? That sounds good. <laughs> on, a, on the back of, of Drive soundtrack. So mm. I would say that the 80s synth is, is kind of popular in America. In, well, in, there's Drab America. Majesty, who are fantastic. Mm. Uh, obviously, churches are, are doing massive in America. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I watched some videos of them on Key XP, Key EXP, and he's playing guitar, isn't he? In, 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 yeah. Well, he's playing more guitar. So I don't know in the first album if he wasn't playing guitar or if he's changed a little bit. He kind of switched back and forth. I mean, he played he played song, uh, guitar in some songs, um, and I think for the closer, for the encore, they had the guitarist from the support band come out and play guitar. Um, but yeah, it was just the three of them on stage, uh, Aiden, his wife on synth, him singing and kind of uh, very energetically occupying a lot of space and kind of dancing and marching around in the middle um, and singing. And then a bassist. Uh, I didn't actually see the bassist who's in all the photos. That's Michael Supoy. I saw Alex McKay from Cutouts. He was on the on their tour in Europe, I oh, think. Okay. Um, but yeah, given there's only three of them on the stage, they uh, they really filled it. Um, filled it very well. Yeah. And they were a memorable band, unlike Vampire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, I I'd never heard of Nation Language. Uh, I was happy to hear that they started a band because of Electricity by OMD, because that's one of my favourite songs of all time. So if there's a song to start a band, why not be that? And uh, yeah, you know, it's music for 80s coming of age films, kind of, isn't it? As uh, you may make it describe is, it. Is it on the Stranger Things soundtrack? That's what I want to know. Well, I think they'd love... So I, I mentioned that one, you know, I think, you know, but, but unfortunately they're too late for the Drive soundtrack. But yeah, although I think Stranger Things are only allowed 80s, uh, artists. Actual yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we're, we're talking about this, guys, because we're recording this. Kate Bush has gone number mm. one in the iTunes chart in the US because running up the hill, running up that hill is uh, is number people one. People under the age of twenty have only discovered that yeah. song. Yeah. Good. I'm yeah. glad. Great video too. Well done. Last series, it was never any story. This time, it's running up the hill. Yeah. What will be season five? Who knows? <laughs> but anyway, we're not here to talk about potential films. We're here to talk about the music. So, George, <laughs> please introduce us to Nation of Language with your first track. Yes, so the, the first track I chose is called September Again. It's from uh, their first album, uh, Introduction Presence, which I think is a good, if slightly pretentious name for a first album. Agreed. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I chose this one. I don't remember this one being played on the radio uh, or on KXP, um, but it was it was really great live. And I took, um, I took a friend who obviously also had never heard of them, but who I sent a couple of YouTube videos to beforehand, and this was the song where he, I mean, he kind of sat up and took, took notice metaphorically. And, and once they finished, he asked me, what, what, what was that one called? Um, so you could go and look it up. So that was a very satisfying moment, you know, when you take someone to a gig. So stressful. <laughs> so stressful yeah, when you take yeah. someone to a gig. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, OK, it's, it's all going to be it's all going to be OK now. Um, and uh, yeah. And and uh, after the gig, I cycled home listening to this slightly too loudly and uh, singing along fairly badly. Yeah, I mean, uh, the bass line is, is really great. Like, um, they turn the bass up quite a lot in the live version, mm -hmm. and then they kind of cut it out in, in the middle, and then, you know, you're, then you're waiting for it to come back, and it was, it was really satisfying what it did. Yeah, and the, the way he shouts, kind of shout sings the, the chorus, the September again, is, is really nice and really satisfying, especially to sing along to. Again, I'm very bad at lyrics, so the first few times I heard it, I had literally no idea what he was saying but it doesn't really matter that much it's nostalgia um, isn't it like yeah and the kind of uh rising synths yeah it's yeah it's just, uh, just a really enjoy this song yeah Brian? um so i put this sounds nostalgic but maybe for the last decade the tens i don't know what we're calling it are we calling it the tens, the tens yeah so like so like white lies and cold cave so it, it, yes, it's it's yes. You can look back to the eighties, but I think it doesn't sound like the eighties. I think the production is more from the last decade. So, um, it's got the sound that I much enjoy, but lacks the energy or spark. It lacks something, mate. But maybe because I listen to a lot of this genre 
So it has to really sort of stand out for me because I've heard too much of this music. I wrote, it feels, nostal- feels nostalgic, but I couldn't place why, right? So with this, with some of the other songs, like I said, the inferences are so obvious. So we're gonna, I think this is going to be a record uh, amount of bands that we're going to mention re- related to, to a band. But I, 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 but I wrote, again, it feels Jack Antonoff-esque. So yeah, I definitely think it's, it's the mesh of kind of the 80s influences and the tense production. You're totally right, Fran. Despite it being Jack Antonoff-esque, he's not usually someone I like. I, I did like this, I think because of the synth arpeggios. I think that's that's what made it for me. The synth arpeggios and the, and the fact that it's melancholic, not melodic, definitely um, put it on my street. So it, it wasn't one of my favourites, actually. There, there, there are others that I liked more. Um, but yeah, I was pleasantly surprised because normally, normally I don't think I would like this kind of song, but I, I did here. Your next choice, George? Uh, the next choice, again, this is a bit, in a bit of a random order, but this is uh, Wounds of Love, which is the second single from the second album, um, A Way Forward. Um, yeah, and uh, a bit of a different vibe, I guess. Um, very much the kind of car folk influence with sci-fi kind of robot noises in the intro and then uh, the bass and the vocals kind of coming in together. Um, and the way it kind of rises into the chorus, I really enjoy, and the kind of mournfulness in his voice. I mean, it's kind of depressing, I guess, but um, yeah, I, I, I broke up in May and much. That's so part of the part of the reason why it chimes with me a little bit. But yeah, it's also kind of you know those things stay with you even if uh, even if you get over them, you know, wounds, but they could be healed over or whatever. And it's just yeah, I don't know it's quite a simple uh, kind of call and refrain of can you ever get past them? No, you can't. Um, and the the kind of Maybe maybe arpeggios is the word I'm looking for. I'm very bad at those kind of music theory terms. The kind of spiraling synth before the second chorus, uh, I really enjoyed as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think a song called Wounds of Love is not going to be cheerful, right? No. Um, and yeah, I, I wrote down Kraftwerk as well. Like, to- totally Kraftwerk. I really like the way it builds and alternates because you have the more spacey verses and then a, a totally different chorus. And I wondered as well, be- because of you know, the clear love for the 80s songs, is it Wounds of Love because it's like Hounds of Love from from Kate Bush? I don't know. There's another song coming up where I'm wondering, I'm like, are you literally putting the name of the band that you're clearly referencing mm-hmm. in this? Um, but yeah, it, it, you know, you put another song from from this album on there and it sounds completely different. Um, and it was interesting to see that, yeah, in such a short space of time, you know, that their sound clearly, clearly changed. And yeah, on, on Pitchfork, um, you know, pretentious music journal du jour, they, they, they rated this album more highly than the first one. But I, I, I don't know yet. I don't know yet how I feel uh, having only listened to a few tracks. Fran? Uh, I think it's got more of a laid back groove than the other tracks on the playlist. Um I guess you guys read that he tried to play Man Machine by Kraftwerk. No. And then he wrote this. There we go. But I think it sounds like another German band, Alphaville. <laughs> We're back in on vo- Alphaville. In vocals and production, it sounds very much like Alphaville. Um, but like enjoy- chilled Alphaville, not... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah but they're not for like... Even for, forever it- Young Alphaville. Yeah, not- Forever Young, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. I enjoy the synth orgasms in the middle section. <laughs> That's the, 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 the official uh, term. Of course, of course. Yeah. <laughs> That's a the musical theory term I can remember. Yeah. <laughs> and I can imagine, you know, this being a slow dance at the school prom, maybe. School um, prom. With, I love how you've Americanized this. <laughs> like... no, but, but Strange things again. Sadly, yeah. that happens in the UK, doesn't it? I, I, I'm pre prom. I'm more school disco it's era. School disco, absolutely. School disco. But I think that happened. No, we had proms, a prom. Yeah. We had a prom, yeah. George. Oh, yeah. dear me. At the end of secondary school, yeah. Oh, no. It's all changed. School disco for me. I mean, okay, I left UK secondary schools when I was 13, but it was school disco. Goes all the way. School just goes. I mean, we had those as well. But with yeah. some weak orange squash for free. And I was in an all-girls school, uh, so for my secondary school. So we had school just goes with the all-boys school, and it was very, Ooh. very awkward because it would be tension. Like one one group standing on one side, another group standing on the other, and then the brave girls would go forth <laughs> to the land of boys. And um, I think I've told this story on the podcast before, but I think it's worth repeating that my dad chaperoned one of those discos when we were twelve, and one of the songs that played was "Sex on the Beach." Um, by oh no, it's not Moose Tea. Is it Moose Tea? Was one of those bands? Well, I want to have sex, sex on, on the, the beach. And I just I I could see my dad at that at that moment, and I saw his face as he was like, "What?" <laughs> my dad is very liberal, is guys, it? but like, yeah. 
Anyway. But you talk about the cocktail, obviously, not actually having sex, obviously. Of course not. And of, of course. course people were not doing actions to match the songs <laughs> at the school disco. Anyway, I wonder, I wonder how much of this will stay in. But <laughs> Can I quickly say that in uh, in year seven, uh, we uh, we had to take it in turns to have a class assembly. And two girls in my class uh, did, oh, let's talk about sex by salt and pepper. <laughs> anyway, moving on. <laughs> So the next track is also from uh, from the second album, uh, and it's across that fine line. Another another single. Yeah, I mean, I guess this is where we get into the very obvious kind of influences uh, on on the sleeve, uh, the bass, uh, very much. I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna get this wrong. New order, Joy Division, kind of a bit of both, but um, and kind of driving from the off, and then um, calms down a bit, and but then sweeps going to those kind of atmospheric synthy synthy bits before uh, kicking into the guitar and the chorus. Yeah, yeah. I, again, just a song I really enjoy. I don't know if I've got a lot more to say about it, but um, I think it's one of the bigger ones on Spotify mm. in terms of pay numbers. People are saying this is a uh, flock of seagulls meet slow dive. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. Ooh. I think he sounds a little bit like the guy from Men in Hats. <laughs> Sorry, from, so, from from one extreme to the I other. Think like... I think he's, he's aiming for. He's aiming for. Uh, <laughs> you I can dance what... if you want to. You can bring your friends <laughs> of mine. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I thought, I thought so he's the aim for in, in joy, but I, I mean uh, Curtis. Uh, but he gets men in house. I don't know what the guy's <laughs> name is. Um, but I, I put down. Sadly, this is just background music for a teen montage video. Again, back to the teens. Sorry, sorry. Well, so for me, I really liked the beginning because the bass is almost sloppy against the very you know polished ex- exacting drums and i really like the first verse but i do think the chorus lets it down i feel like here the way that it builds it doesn't build to to much and it was easily my least favorite of the place but I, I didn't dislike it i just again i thought i don't know it's that thing of like fantasy producer hat of like i just want to shift things around a little bit maybe you know add a few more instruments or take a few few away there yeah i, I did think when i was listening to this one i enjoy it but i think maybe it could either be slightly shorter or they need to build more because it feels like they get to the kind of the high point of the song quite early and then don't have anywhere to go but um yeah so in conclusion Still. the three of us need to go and help produce their album and they're going to be absolutely fine uh, obviously yeah. for this to be their biggest song on spotify is this being played somewhere is it on like a film or i don't know if it's the biggest but it's certainly one of the bigger ones mm. but uh let me, let me tell you let me go on spotify i'm relying on babs for the, um, the stats I, i've already got cities up yeah it is it is the most popular one oh no actually sorry the one of the next ones that's coming up is the most popular one but it's uh. the it's the second one it, it, oh, really? it, it's on top um but uh but yeah uh I, I i don't know why we'll have to find out because yeah it doesn't sound like the most instant track um, so I'm surprised it is that, that unless it's like you know, being played on radio loads in America maybe who knows mm. but, um, so yeah but what's your next track George and the next one uh, for the sake of variety given they've only got two albums I, I picked a, a cover so they covered uh, Gouge Away and I have to say I don't know the original very well I mean I know it kind of passingly but not not in intimate detail to be able to tell you what this kind of adds or does differently um, but yeah I, I enjoy the kind of Slightly threatening, unsettling bass and vocals, which I guess are all you know in the kind of Pixies originals, and uh, and then kind of the way the the kind of wall of wall of synths kicks in all at once, um, and then drops away again. Yeah, I thought it was a, a decent cover, but as I say, I'm not au fait with the original. Well, Babs is a Babs is a big Pixies fan. I'm so. I, I am a big fan of the album that uh, this one comes from, Debaser. I I wouldn't say I'm across all Pixies, but yeah, this is one of this is possibly my favourite Pixie song. Uh, don't quote me. Just so this was a risk. <laughs> but saying. I thought this was great. I thought this was really, really great because it works really well. They're making their mark. They're making a synth version of, of Gouge Away. What I particularly enjoyed was the bass and the drums make the rhythm of the song sound different. So while it definitely, you know, is... Uh, you know, it's 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 really not too dissimilar to the original in terms of kind of structure and even kind of the 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 harmonies and and you know Kim Kim Deal's vocals. Um, uh, it it definitely they they have made it their own. The only thing that I wish they had done is made it a little bit less polished because it, you know it's Pixies. It's very kind of messy and angular. And for example, in the original. When uh, when he's in the verses, can you even call them verses? And he goes, "You stroke my locks." Like the guitar is suspended, and then it comes back, uh, and so you really feel that power. Whereas here, the the synths are kind of constant. So 
I think because knowing the original, I, I was like, oh, I wish they'd done a bit more of that. Maybe use silence a bit more to 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 still keep that essence. But no, I thought it was a really great cover, Fran. And I agree. I I, I prefer us to the original. Oh wait, and I, 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 I was not going that far. And <coughs> I think, no, but, but I think it's actually a really, really good idea to um no, to strip back the guitars and completely change it with, with synth pop. You know, it'd be interesting to hear Nirvana songs in, in disguise as well. You know, um, I, so I think if you're going to do a cover, why not do something completely different? So mm. I always enjoy like you know uh, a male singing a female vocal. It's, it's interesting to hear di- different sides of it. Um, I, it sounds quite sexy, <laughs> bizarrely. Okay, ladies, we know what Fran's putting on his sexy playlist. Uh, who knew that Gouge Away would come across as sexy? Like, really have you read the lyrics? The it's really, <laughs> it's really. Nice. I don't, lyrics? What are lyrics? Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I think this is the best song on the playlist. But it's uh-huh. a cover, but it's cover very much with their fingers. Away, oh, one one hundred percent. Like, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I'm really a fan of good covers. I, I, mm. I, I don't know. I, I feel like I admire them as much as the original songs because I think I'm a fairly literally minded person sometimes. So when someone has the ability to kind of break something down and, and transform it, I, I really mm. admire them. So yeah, I, I agree. Great inclusion on the playlist. And finally, George. Uh, and the last song is from the first album again, uh, On Division Street. Which I guess purpose of saying is that it was the, one of the top played on Spotify, which is kind of surprising because I don't think it's a single. Well yeah. yeah, because it's not it's not a single, um, and I certainly don't remember hearing it a lot on the on KXB when it first came out. But yeah, I mean, this is another one with um, <clears throat> with very kind of eighties direct eights eighties references, uh, and the bass uh, fairly similar to uh, to um, across that fine line, I guess at the beginning, a bit of a bit a bit kind of bouncier. Um, and the rising synths again, and uh, the kind of levels over the top. Um, yeah, and apparently it's um, it's about Newark in New Jersey, so not about New York. Um, but and people in in Chicago think it's about Chicago because obviously there's a division street uh, there. But um, yeah, they would, I read an interview and they were talking about um, records having a sense of place. And uh, they actually reference Vampire Weekend's uh, Modern Vampires of the City as as an album with a strong sense of place. So I thought it was interesting that there was there was some influence there, obviously, uh, between the two bands and kind of, uh, yeah, moody atmospherics and, and kind of bouncing synths. Um, yeah, I think this is uh, kind of lively and a bit poppy. Um, but yeah, I enjoyed it. Yeah, George, have you ever heard of the New Order song, Bizarre Love Triangle? Um, Quite possibly. Because if you have, I think you would not like the song. And I, because to me, this is bizarre love triangle. The okay. bass line, the keyboard, if this is exactly the same, yeah. almost. Okay. And, I, and I can't give it a critique because I can't not hear New Order, unfortunately. And I think if you're boring so much, it can hurt it. Like yeah. isolated for German entry in your vision because it felt like, well, this isn't you. <laughs> you know, you just heard two songs and put them together. And unfortunately, it felt like Bizarre Love Triangle uh, with the vocals from the guy from the drums. And that put me off, unfortunately. But perhaps you uh, uh, yeah. agree? I was, I was that. So I was like, this is knowingly ripping off Joy Division slash New Order with that bass opening. But I don't mind it. Right. So I think I wonder if this is just the, the age difference as well. Right. Of like I, I obviously didn't listen to Bizarre. I mean, I don't think you did either, but I didn't listen to Bizarre Love Triangle at the time. I only came to it more recently. But <laughs> I, I, I wrote it's basically Bizarre Love Triangle, but who cares? Because <laughs> it's got synth arpeggios and other stuff going on. And um, I think the lyrics were really atmospheric as well. But yeah, I, I was pointing at you, Fran, because I was like, when you said New Order, I was like, have you written down the exact same song I have? <laughs> yes. Yes, is that, is that a bad thing though, that we both think well, but, but, but this this is the thing right because i don't know i i i will read a quote about their first album from from pitch pork pitch pork oh god too much too much beer pitch pork <laughs> so uh about the, the debut album they say introduction presence doesn't offer any great reinventions notes of altered images early depeche mode or even modern contemporaries like black marble are impossible to ignore while listening but their understanding of the genre they're working in its workings tropes and trappings is so refined that they are able to boil it down to its barest essence saving catharsis for just the right moment and i mean i wouldn't be able to express it as eloquently as that but i i, I do agree like it, it is well this one and the craft uh, craft worky wounds of love definitely it's like you are <laughs> you are you are trans transponding it but yes but for me it was the the baseline everything else uh was new so i i, I got that vibe as well but i but yeah i i didn't mind it 
I think I probably, I think I would probably know because I love, love Triangle that was played, but it's not, yeah, so imprinted in my, my mind. But yeah, uh, so unfortunately for me, it, it, yeah, I, I can't unseeing that i mean the, also the fact that it's called on division street i was like are yeah, they literally referencing yeah, the fact yeah. it's Joy division that's that's what i what i thought but no but but to, to counter fran despite it being so obvious to me that the baseline was was that i i did enjoy it and the lyrics are great you know you buried me right where i belong and i'm still waiting there on division street i would like to find the answers i was always rudely denied a song so sweet from back when I was born. The loving creak of floorboards by the door. Hopeful I waited, hopeful I called. But no one would answer it all on Division Street. Aww. Nice. But even the keyboards, like, the dee -dee 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 -dee, that's the like same as Bizarre Love Triangle too. so... Um, too much. But, so I guess, you know, maybe like Vampire Weekend, I think, you know, the early albums, they were too much like Paul Simon. Maybe it would take Nation of the Language a little bit longer to find their own sound. Um, yeah. so, you know, it's, it's, I think a lot of new bands start off by showing their influences, then later on they become, you know, a bit like we mentioned Japan. You know, Japan, five years later, completely different band. I was listening to their debut album today and I was loving it, by the way, Fran. So, it's good, isn't it? But you can good. see why, you know, it's a bit New York Dolls with keyboards. But I'm, I don't I'm know New York Dolls. So that's this, oh. but this, this, it's all about knowledge, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. like, again, I've mentioned this many times before, but I remember really enjoying the choral and my mum being like, yeah, I had this back in the 60s, mate. And I was like, oh, but I haven't. <laughs> so yeah. I'm enjoying this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that was the kind of narrative with a lot of the reviews and interviews was kind of, yeah, the first one there, you know, maybe a bit more uh, leaning heavily on their influence and then the second album a bit more... Um, yeah, a bit more, uh, a, bit, a step further removed, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I, I don't know the influences necessarily well enough to, uh, to be able to judge. Now that you have your parents' record collection, I think you will. I'll, I'll build up to it, yeah, sure. yeah. It's, it's just how people, you know, felt when the Strokes became big. The, the fucking yeah. ripping of Tom Petty, you know, it's, everyone's always yeah. saying, ripping off somebody. It's very hard to be, you know, a unique band these days, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, like, I, I mean, I find it very boring. People are like, oh my God, if people refer to Kate Bush as a stranger thing, it's like, so what if they do? It's a good song. Just let the good, mm. good music go out there. And, you know, if it means that, you know, now George is going to go off and listen to Bizarre Love Triangle and tell other people about it, great. More, more power to them. Um, and then George can start his own band. Yeah. Yeah, George. When when's that gonna happen? I wasn't a band. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. oh a band. tell us more. I don't know this, and I, uh, I, I own you. Did you not know this? No. <laughs> well, it was nothing like this. It was a it was a ska band. We 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 covered ska songs, and I played keyboards. But what year was ska? Was this like the first wave or the second American wave of ska? Well, we 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 covered things from things also that weren't ska and just kind of vaguely had some brass in it. But we did specials. We did madness. Uh, we did at some points try to do like real big fish stuff, but uh, not really. Um, I probably got a list of songs we could want to play somewhere, but uh, guys, when we have that Patreon that we keep talking about, <laughs> George is gonna dig it up and uh, and we did we did record three songs in the nice. music block at school. Ah. But <laughs> did you ever like, play at like events, you know, like weddings? Yeah, we definitely played at events. I mean, it was all covers, so like we we actually made some money by uh, yeah, getting to play gigs. Kind of, you know, 20 quid each and a beer or whatever. But, you know, still, not bad. Nice. I always find in the UK that, like, Scar always does well in, like, the rural parts of the UK. So if it goes to, like, <laughs> if it goes to, like Taunton, they look, Cider and Scar are massive. I always find that yeah. seems to be the sort of thing. I, I've not been to Lose. Is it a little bit further afield than Brighton? Do you have a different music taste than the Brighton? Um, I mean, it's pretty close to pretty close to Brighton, and I guess... Uh, Politically fairly similar, but you know, surrounded by Tories, so that's that has its issues. But um, no, I mean, I think Scar is kind of like it's a good thing for like a party or a wedding or whatever because it's fairly low low bar for entry and lively, and people move to it easily, even if they don't actually. And especially if you're playing covers, they you know they don't really need to know who you are, like your your basically background, but that's fine. <laughs> um, so what happened to the band? Why did it disband? Well, we, we went to university. Oh, okay. and then... uh, Taylor's oldest time. So, yeah, Fran, what's your views on Nation of Language? I, I went in expecting to like them more. <gasps> um, so, so, like I said, I think it, maybe it's early days. Uh, I like the sound, but unfortunately, if I was going to go and listen to this sort of music, I have better versions already in my collection. So I will see how they develop. I mean, yeah, they are very young. They formed mm. in 2018, right? So mm. it's it's a very young band. Uh, I will be more positive. No, I, I, I really enjoyed this. Um, I didn't mind as much that the influences were so so much on the sea, but I guess I'm maybe not as into the genre as, as Fran 
Although, yeah, I am, I'm very much into Dark Wave, which, Fran, we've talked about before and you, you hadn't really heard of, right? I guess this is kind of on the border because it's, yeah, like, there are, I guess, the more melodic, more more pop elements. It's not all doom and gloom. Um, but, yeah, no, I, I, I saved, I think, three or four of the songs from, from the playlist and... Um, I hadn't I hadn't gotten around to to listening to the the new song Androgynous, but um, I think especially if you say George, they're a very good live band. I'm on board. I'm on board the Nation of Language train. Choo choo, underrated. Choo choo. Choo choo. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I, I obviously think they're underrated, and it could be you know it could be I just chose the wrong songs for you, friend. But because uh, there are plenty of others, I've but uh, yeah. So George, I mean. Do you have anything to to plug? I feel I feel like you should tell people who you are. We haven't really covered that, but you know you are British, but you're not living in the UK. Tell us who are you? What do you do? What do you want to talk about? Go for it. Well, I, I don't have anything to plug. This is the first time I've ever been on a on a podcast, so you know, not the kind last. of going um, <laughs> going on the basis that no one needs more white men with a podcast. But um, <laughs> uh, yeah, like I'm from the UK, as you say, I lived in, in Brussels, which is where I met where I met Babs and uh, since 2018 been living in, in the Netherlands now I'm here and I work also like Babs in kind of sustainability climate uh, fields now is, now is the no. chance do you want to promote your project or or anything related to to kind of I guess Extinction Rebellion or anything like that well but it's it's quite it quite a niche <laughs> if there are any any procurers who are interested in <laughs> doing more with green public procurement than uh then yeah they should check out the co2 performance ladder but like i imagine there's not a huge overlap with your <laughs> your audience yeah, i think well, you'll be surprised do you have any guilt seeing like american bands touring do you feel like oh they shouldn't be uh <laughs> flying around no right, right, yeah i mean you know there's lots of things that probably shouldn't happen and i feel like playing live music is is something i will uh i will allow um yeah. While well, like Exxon yeah. making profit, uh, mm. I guess American Bands. Yeah, control. exactly. Yeah. There, are, there are other priorities. Yeah. yeah. I have discovered the band. The band is the Chain Gang of 1974, George. Okay. I've never heard of them. The Chain Gang. The Chain of Gang of 1974. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, Sleepwalking, I think you may enjoy. Uh, okay. Give my, give my blast. Pay the tip. Thanks. But yeah, I mean, I, I can say I have been to Nijmegen to to visit George, and it is it is a nice, I would say, an underrated Dutch city. <laughs> because honestly, I don't think I'd ever heard of it before I moved to to Belgium. Um, we went to a lovely brewery. The band d- two lovely breweries, oh yeah, sorry, two lovely breweries. I just I just remember the one <laughs> when we took photos. Uh, I'm re- I'm yeah. a big fan of the the band De Stat, the Nijmegen band uh, De Stat. So I, I highly recommend it. And yeah, from George's description, it sounds like there's a lot of good live music venues, concerts going on over there. So Nijmegen, yeah, check next, it out. Next time you come, we can see if there's anything on that Dollar Ocean. Yes, please. On board. And uh, Nina Simone lived here for a bit, actually. Yes, she did. Some random trivia. I have no idea why. but uh, uh, Because yeah. I think for the same reasons that Marvin Gaye lived in Ostend, tax Oh, okay. and yeah i found that out in a in the netflix, nina, nina yeah. simone <laughs> documentary that's on netflix if it's and, uh, just justin hawkins lives in geneva now no seriously <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow i mean i know that tina turner lives in switzerland but that to me makes a bit more sense than justin hawkins <laughs> so there we go. but um yeah so um any final thoughts any, Babs? any final thoughts um i i love synths I think is is my final thoughts. You know, uh, disclosure: we're re- recording this back to back, having having done um, you know the new romantics episode, and I've just I've really enjoyed getting into very synthy, weird synthy bands. And you know, just because we're in an era of hip hop and and pop punk doesn't mean that they shouldn't be considered. Bring back the simps, bring back the love. BBTS, BBTL. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, George, for being a guest. Thanks for having me, yeah. Bye. Well, thank you very much for sticking to the end for this episode. We hope you enjoyed it. You know, there's a million and one New York bands that we could do, and I'm sure it's not the only New York bands we'll do in the future, and especially because I still want Fran to introduce me to the New York Dolls, 
So we even have bands with New York in the title that we need to do. So if there's more New York bands, bands with New York in the title, or any other bands you'd like us to talk about in future episodes, get in touch. Our Twitter handle is at OU Music Pod. On Instagram, it's at un- over underrated music pod. And you can email us over underrated music pod at gmail.com. New Yorkers or otherwise, citizens of the world, see you next time. <laughs>